Good evening. My name is Jenna Birch and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at Westchester University. Thank you for joining us for the WCU 150 History and Heritage Exhibition Lecture and Tour Series. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that our le next lecture and tour will focus on the history of WCU's sculpture collection. So please save the date for next Wednesday, April 13th at 6.30 p.m. and register online at wcualumni.org. You can also find the complete list of lectures on the Alumni Association website and recordings of previous events. Please remain on mute until the end of this presentation, at which time you'll be invited to provide feedback and questions related to the subject. For the best experience, we recommend having your viewing screen set to speaker, which will allow you to view the presentation in the largest format. This can be found on the top right-hand corner of your screen. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Museum Director, Michael D. Giovane. Hi, and welcome to the WCU 150 History and Heritage Exhibition uh, put on by the uh, uh, Westchester University Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology and the students uh, in our Museum Studies program. We have a great uh, installment of our thematic tour and lecture uh, today. We're, we're focusing on the military history of Westchester University. Um, but before we int I introduce our guests uh, who will be taking us on a tour of this exhibition, um, I did want to just say a couple words, as I always do, so if you've seen this before, you've heard it all before, but um, about this exhibition. So this is you know, one of the cornerstones of our, of our sesquicentennial celebration, but it was, it's also the capstone for uh, the museum studies program, uh, minor program. And so students in that program take a, a range of courses, including like a seminar, of the history and development of museums, collections care and management, where you learn how to you know, conserve artifacts and catalog them. And then of course this, um, museum curation class where you curate, you learn to curate from start to finish an exhibition. You also write a, a, an article for, for our published catalog. We have a virtual exhibition component, which is we work with the, the Office of Digital Learning and Innovation. We have a 3D kind of a thing in general. We'll put that link up as well. Um, and, you know, every year it changes. And you know, it was a great year, I think. You know, this is one of our last tours. Here, we're going to shut down at the end of this month. Um, our sesquicentennial will, uh, celebrations will, will finish. But uh, when we first started, you know, we were looking for artifacts. We didn't know what was going to go here or what the theme was. And do you remember, what was the big idea? This is, I'm sorry, this is Chelsea Moore, <laughs> one of our student co-curators. She's also an 1871 graduate, uh, honor fellow. Um, and of course, Bob Kodosky, Robert Kodosky, uh, professor of history here in, in, in Westchester. Um, we were thinking about this. Uh, what was the big idea? What were we trying to, to show? We wanted to show um, basically the 150 years of Westchester within these different themes, such as military service, which we're going to talk about tonight, student life, Greek life, clubs and involvement, learning, academics and research, and the art program. We wanted to highlight all those different areas um, through different artifacts and research that us students have done. Yeah, exactly. And everybody did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. Chelsea worked on a number of these, these mm -hmm. uh, exhibits as well. We also had this great timeline um, around, everybody wanted a timeline. We're talking to our donors and our lenders and everything. They really wanted to know, like, we want to see the development, right? Trace the transformations from our origins as a normal school that taught, you know, college, uh, high school age kids to be, um, to be elementary school teachers through uh, the Westchester State Teachers College era, to the State College era in the 60s to the 80s, and then Westchester University that we know today, the largest of the, of the Apache schools. Um, and, you know, what's interesting, of course, is that, you know, for better or for worse, you know, we, we have a lot of our history of the United States. We've had a number of periodic uh, military incursions. Um, and what that means is we can actually trace history, which I think you're going to do today, uh, of Westchester University through the lens of the different service uh, wars and, and, and military incursions and service members' um, experiences here. Is that, is that what we're going to do today? Yeah. All right, so why don't you take... Hold on. Um, you guys are muted. Hold on. There you go. Okay. Um, so just like I said, I wanted to thank everyone who attends tonight via Zoom. Uh, we're going to start over 
even before the university was even a thing, um, we have a talk with Dr. Kodowski tonight about Camp Wayne and our evolution through um, military service here and our military veterans and things at Westchester University. Sure, you want to go over? You yes, want to over let's here? walk on over. To our first exhibit case, which basically shows the world in 1871, what it was like. I mean, we had all kinds of, you know, interesting things going on. That what you're looking at right now is um, uh, our artifacts from a wedding in 1871 here in Westchester, um, including these uh, Carte de Vigite, which were like uh, the garotypes, like earlier uh, photography. Um, and down below, we have what the world was like in 1871. And some of these things, we might be thinking about some of the military, um, our military history itself, war and peace. You have here Leo Tolstoy's uh, uh, autographed copy, Jules Verne's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. We have a pre colonial um, Congolese sculpture from the year before it was colonized by the Belgians. Um, and uh, a, a Qing Dynasty scholar scroll, Meiji era. Uh, Japan uh, plate. The Ottoman Empire was around, the sick man of Europe. Uh, and also that this was the Risorgimento, the great uh, unifying war uh, in Italy. And 1871 was the year that Rome was declared the capital of, of Italy. But more importantly, when they were, we had this um, normal school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, here, um, uh, well, first we had a Westchester Academy downtown, Westchester, across from St. Agnes. We sold that off and mm -hmm. uh, to, to build this normal school on Camp Wayne, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna talk anymore. <laughs> you know, I just love talking about all these artifacts. We'll keep bringing you back. Mike. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Kodowski, can you talk a little bit more about what Camp Wayne was and how it contributes to Westchester's history? Sure, thank mm -hmm. you, Chelsea. <laughs> and thank you, Michael, for having me. And Thank you, uh, everybody uh, who's out there, and for the veterans who are out there, welcome home. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with veterans at the univers this university for the last uh, 20 years. And I think one thing that emerges as a, a theme through all of this, and certainly I've, I've seen it, is the uh, in, incredible inspirational service that veterans bring to our campus. Uh, some of you are probably aware, my colleague, Dr. Kulikowski, uh, wrote a book, which is available in the bookstore, a 150 year uh, celebration. And she, she titled it, We Serve. And I, I think that's true on, on our campus. Um, I'm struck every day uh, by the commitment to service exhibited by our faculty, by our students, um, and certainly so exemplified by our veterans. Um, I, I titled this talk tonight, uh, this conversation, Lofty Sentiments of Duty, A History of Military Service at WCU. And that comes from comments that a local paper made about Camp Wayne, um, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But you know, a long time later, a 1969 graduate of Westchester, a gentleman by the name of Martin Burnt, who um, went on to become a Lieutenant General, um, graduated in 1969, served in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and who uh, led a rescue mission in Serbia in 1995 for a down pilot. Um, his, his brother said, um, General Berndt has passed away, that his motto was selfless service to others. And I, I think you, you don't even have to pay a lot of attention tonight that that sort of just runs through all of this. Um, Camp Wayne, uh, obviously the Civil War happened before this institution existed. And the land that we're, we're standing on now um, was land that they used for uh, county fairs and agricultural exhibits and things like that. And when the Civil War broke out, I'm sure you're all familiar with the geography, we're not far from the South. And so the locals petitioned for a military camp here. And ultimately, um, the 9th, the 11th, and the 97th regiments of Pennsylvania trained uh, on 15 acres, which occupied the northwest corner of uh, Rosedale and Church Street um, from May of 1861 until October of, of 1862. 
And they liked this land because it was flat, it was unplowed. There was an exhibition hall here, which they used for an infirmary. Um, and in addition to that, there were two water wells. And so everything was sort of in place for an encampment. And it's, it's kind of interesting, the, the quotation, the full quotation, the observation uh, that the local paper made about the ones who came here said, a high spirit of courage and patriotism animates the volunteers at Camp Wayne. Men of wealth, position, science, and mechanical skill are among the volunteers. They have not been forced into service, but with lofty sentiments of duty have rushed forth to support the honor of the flag. Um, you know, so this observation that, you know, men had come from all different um, places in society to gather here, and, and they created encampments. There was quite a lot of camaraderie, you can tell uh, from some of the encampment names. Uh, they had the Jeff Davis Terror, the Home of the Righteous, and uh, for whatever reason, peaches and cream. Um, maybe the encampment guard ladies, maybe the encampment name ladies guard makes more sense based on some of the other observations at the time of the camp, which I think sort of foreshadow uh, some of the town and gown issues that we've seen since. Uh, Judge Joseph J. Lewis said, those are pretty rough looking fellows, quite fit for war, I think it not the best thing for us that these patriots have come amongst us. They have not conducted themselves so as to do themselves much credit, and the town has become sorry and disorderly by means of their presence. Mm -hmm. And continuing with that theme, uh, a parade through our streets, keeping time to the music of a violin, they were much admired and crowds followed them cheering lustily. They are great favorites with the ladies. And then mm -hmm. there were, of course, reports about Lancaster girls coming in and visiting the camp, running about the streets and leading a vagrant life generally. So um, Camp Wayne became really the, the first of three times that I'm aware um, if you exclude ROTC, which of course exists on campus where this campus was used as um, a military camp. It, it was during the First World War and Second World War II that we'll talk about. So Camp Wayne is kind of an interesting segment, right? That, that, that precedes all of this. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to continue on with um, one of our presidents, Mr. Phillips. This is his desk right here. And he's kind of the um, evolutionary one that with his, presidency, he continues on to make sure that we still have a good program for our student veterans. And with him, he kind of revolutionized our university as it is today. So he is a very big part of our university's history, as well as our veterans and our military here. We also, continuing on um, in 1895, Frederick Douglass spoke here. This was his last speech. Um, last public speech ever before he passed away 19 days later. And so also a couple of years after that in 98, we have Cuban support on campus, which Dr. Dossi, if you want to talk about the, um, we transitioned from the Civil War all the way up into the Spanish American War. Yeah, you know, it's, um, so that the, I, I think the war against Spain that the United States was involved in not only continues to illustrate that level of service, um, but it also illustrates sort of another theme that you see going through our history. And that's, a, that's I think, a really unique connection between the ones on campus and the ones who deploy. Um, you know, there's a, there's a combat psychiatrist by the name of Jonathan Shays that says the most important thing for veterans uh, to come home to or to be aware of is, is a supportive community, an engaged community, one that really cares about what's going on. And you, you see that, and you see it, uh, the, the, the student newspapers through the course of this institution's history are online digitally, you can read them. And what you see is this engagement through the newspapers between ones deployed and students here, where students and faculty are, are, are supporting the ones that they know who go away. And the ones who go away are writing back and commenting about their time at Westchester. And it's, it's really kind of fascinating. Um, 
So when, when the war against Spain broke out, the amulet, which is what the student newspaper at the time was yeah. called. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's a copy of it here. It's a good thing we brought you, Michael. Yeah, right, there you go. Good for <laughs> so the, the amulet, um, the author was Melvin M. Heckler, who said, we have a mission to accomplish for liberty and humanity, but this bugle call also reminds us of our duty at home. With great seriousness, with solemn purposes, we must look forward to our country's welfare. The welfare depends on what we are. And it went on to talk about a Mr. Carl G. Schrader and George Hoffman, who had uh, chosen the hardship of war for the good of others. We are proud of them and hope to have them with us soon. Um, I, I'm sure most of you know during this time the, the normal school trained elementary school teachers. And so the ones who graduated were almost, almost entirely women, but there was also a male population here because the secondary school system in Pennsylvania uh, wasn't particularly adequate. And so boys would come here and, and sort of get the equivalent of a secondary education and then move on to other institutions of higher learning. Um, and actually, I learned something because I, I thought that as well. And I think when we were doing the gender discussion, males actually were outnumbered females at first until World War I. And then it switched because everybody was uh, yeah. You know, but yeah, it was always a female dominated. Uh, they got the degrees. Right. Who yeah. actually got the teaching degrees. Right, right. right. There yeah. were lots of boys yeah. here, but right. they moved on. And you moved the girls, on after two years. Right, right, right. So it's kind of this interesting dynamic, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you have this support from the students. And then, you know, writing, this is, uh, there was a Camp Hastings in Lebanon County at, at Mount Gretna. And this is from May 17th, 1898. Carl Schrader wrote back, and at the time, there were two competing literary societies, right? The Aryan and the Moor. And the amulet, I think, was produced by the Aryan mm -hmm. Society. And he, he was an Aryan, and he said, I've never felt so closely attached to the Aryan Society as now that I am temporarily detached. You have seen me at different Aryan occasions climbing the ladder, but this does not compare to the many little and big odd things one falls into in soldier life. So... You know, here's this guy who's, you know, deployed and I mean, he's writing this letter back to Westchester, right, back to his buddies and, and back to the people he knows. And kind of funny, he, you know, he talks about the, dr the drilling that was going on at camp. And then he talks about dinner and he says, the table etiquette is not as rigid as it is in the normal. So <laughs> in the military, they're, they're not quite the disciplinarians that they were at the normal school. There were a number who, who deployed, and for the most part, during this war, uh, they remained stateside. It's, it seems like they all got malaria at one point or another. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of O.O. O. Barr who deployed to Puerto Rico, um, and they were, this is from the newspaper, after the war, uh, in Puerto Rico, O.O. Barr in the 4th Pennsylvania, they were all drawn up in a line of battle awaiting the word to charge when word came that hostilities were at an end. And so that was his service. Um, students saw the soldiers off, gave them a warm welcome home with the amount of noise they made may be taken as any indication of the warmth of the welcome extended. So, you know, you see that connection during the deployment and then, you know, seeing these boys off and then seeing them come back. And that only intensifies, I think, moving forward. The other thing that I think was really interesting is that, you know, Chelsea was talking about Phillips. Um, he, he really did, like you said, revolutionize and expand the, the normal school. I mean, he built most of the buildings that we see today, the oldest ones, um, from an inf and some that aren't here, the infirmary, obviously, you know, uh, but recitation hall, the first gym, which isn't here anymore. But um, one of the things he also was really committed to, apparently, was to bring in uh, international students, and uh, especially from the Caribbean post-Spanish-American uh, uh, War. Uh, and so that was a big, there was a big bump there uh, as well of, of different students, of, of Latino mm -hmm. students. Cool. Mm -hmm. right. Then moving uh, right along on the timeline, we have, um, you know, in early 1900s, you have the outbreak of World War I in 1914. 
And it specifically mm -hmm. hits our campus in 1917 when we have um, a normal school student. We have him pictured up here with his uh, wife um, as he's off to uh, fight in the war. So Dr. Kodoski, how did the campus react to the First World War? Well, I have, um, we're, we're of course standing now in the Francis Harvey Green Library, right? And Francis Harvey Green wrote in the 1919 Serpentine, which was the yearbook, what meaning lies enfolded in the phrase Westchester State Normal Boys in the Service. Youthful and full of promise, ambitious and full of hope, red-blooded and full of determination, vigorous and full of activity, earnest, enlightened, enthusiastic. So, you know, there was a, a participation and, and it really resonates deeply on campus, the First World War. Um, before we talk about the ones who deployed, talking here, um, there is, I see up there a placard for the Student Army Training Corps. Um, the Student Army Training Corps was under Lieutenant uh, William C. Briggs, and it was basically a, a preparation for boys here to go into officer training. Um, and it, it opened in, in October of 1918. And <clears throat> you're probably um, all aware that the war ended in November of 1918. And, and what came to Westchester in October 1918 was not only you know, sort of this connection to the First World War, but also uh, something we're familiar with, a global pandemic. And um, there, there was a poem that a student wrote. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened the door and influenza. <laughs> and so it, the school shut down during that time period, but certainly students um, on campus and mostly um, uh, women who were here who wanted to support the war. So the women who were here ended up producing 50,000 surgical dressings for the Red Cross and they went to work knitting. And so they knitted, the, the numbers that I have are 84 pairs of socks and 88 sweaters to send to the troops overseas. Um, and they also created something called the Westchester Normal Land Army. Did you, did you run into the Normal Land Army? No. So the, 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 there was a big debate, could women farm could women were women capable of farming because you know right outside of westchester you know to some extent today but certainly then there was a lot of farmland and the boys here used to help the farmers work the land and now you know the boys were gone and so there was a professor on campus who sort of it was an experiment you know can we get women to do and there was all of this trepidation and the women weren't sure if they were able to do it and they're sort of talking about it and then they go out and they have a, just a marvelous time picking beans and husking corn and potatoes. And so, you know, they create this land army and they start to outreach to other campuses, including Swarthmore and the University of Pennsylvania to make it sort of a coordinated effort. Um, so kind of a cool thing. And, uh, you know, other ways that they lent their support, um, they had uh, service flags in the dining hall. And they would have stars for you know each person who deployed. And I think it's kind of interesting. One of the dining hall tables had a star for a Colonel, Colonel Robert A. Mearns. And why I think that's interesting is, is he left here in 1887. And I don't know if he graduated or if he just moved on. It, it isn't really clear, but you know, that already that connection of a legacy, right? Um, and other forms of support, I love this. There, there's an article, it was just called Don't Talk, Work. Uh, during the great catastrophe over there as a whole, we talk entirely too much for our own good and for the good of others. Let this great crisis be a lesson to us as students to spend at least half our time working for others and avoid the silly senseless talk that so pervades our society. So, you know, kind of all, you know, this, this seriousness on campus. And they were regularly reading letters from over there. Um, you know, Bob Yoakum, who was a member of the class of 1917, writing back said, I work at normal, certainly help me out here. I'm teaching a French Lieutenant English. 
probably not according to the standard method. He in turn is teaching me French. Um, Dan Beaver, who graduated in 1918, enclosed a button taken from the blouse of a German prisoner. He sent it to Miss Speakman and she was kindly consented to show it to anyone who wishes to see it. So, you know, this connection, right? You know, that was, that was very, I mean, in this case, tangible where people are sending things back. In the end, killed during the First World War from Westchester was Elmer, Elmer D. Fix, uh, C. Justin Criswell, Robert Pritchard, and Ira E. Lady. And Francis Harvey Green wrote about Ira Lady saying of these fellows that we were called upon to give their lives, that were called upon to give their lives, Lieutenant Lady looms large in our thought, partly because he was a teacher in the school, partly because his brother and sister are members of 1919. So his two siblings were here and he was killed. Um, Francis Harvey Green went on to say he had, gave us a rare spirit and the place made vacant in the school in his home and in our hearts is hard to fill. And, you know, one of the last letters that Ira Lady wrote back because he wrote through the First World War, it's amazing. The world, he, this is what he wrote. He said, the world is looking to you fellows to write it, to fill it with love and to give it a new ideal, an ideal worthwhile. What will be your response? It will be what you have set up for your own ideal. Any man can make his life what he will if he is willing to pay the price, but only those will make their lives what they can be who catch the spirit of trust, obedience, sacrifice for the best things to be sincere with all the world, to see the good and beautiful in all about you, to help those whom you meet and to trust God absolutely is a symphony worth, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And you know, this is in the middle of a war zone and he's taking the time to write that back to the campus. Um, I'm surprised there isn't, I, Ira Lady has, there's, I think it's an American Legion post named after him in his hometown north of Gettysburg. And I, I don't know that there's a presence anywhere on campus. No, but I think that should be something we advocate for, something for some of our uh, military. Members. Right. Yeah, this, it sounds like he, in a very short time, made a really uh, big impact on a number of people, including Francis Harvey Green. Sure. Right. So this was, he sent to Francis Harvey Green, these letters, where are these well, letters no, he, now? They're, in, they're in the end. Of it. I don't they know were, where the actual letters they are. Published yeah. them they the published end. them in the end. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about the amulet is it's kind of like a, a one of the earliest news papers, I would say, news magazines, mm -hmm. uh, but also creative writing outlet. Oh, I mean, yeah. It was, it was right. a, All a very of versatile kind of a thing. So you could have these kind of longer kind of right. letters and things that were right. published. Yeah. And people read back then. Yeah, they did. They wrote, <laughs> they wrote read. They read back then, Chelsea. They did. They did. <laughs> well, continuing, we, uh, after World War One, obviously, we have the um, continuation of World War II. Um, so we have here, um, as Julia will show, we have the military case that highlights um, our military don't service. Do this over um, through we highlight World War II. Uh, this case also talks about um, Korea, Vietnam, uh, but mostly focuses on World War II and some of our veterans that served through World War II. So, Dr. Dr. Kadasi, what happened during the Second World War here on campus? Um, and how were our students affected by it? Yeah, well, it, yeah, you know, um, I, I, looking at the student newspaper, um, they, you know, when they learned about Pearl Harbor on campus, um, Bill Lukens, who was a student, says, I wasn't surprised, but I can't believe it. Uh, another young man said, I thought it was an Orson Welles program. Huh. And another one who probably was the one who was most prophetic um, said, I thought, here I go in the army. And, you know, through the course of the Second World War, there were about a thousand uh, students, faculty, um, and alum who served, and about 30 who were killed. Um, when the attack at Pearl Harbor happened, there were three Westchester students who were in Hawaii. Hmm. And what they had to say, because they printed these letters in December, 
you know, after Pearl Harbor, but they wrote these letters before Pearl Harbor. So Richard Abrams wrote about the only fault that I can find is the administration of calisthenics. Seems to me they should take a course at good old Westchester. So we've already established, right, that Westchester is more rigorous in terms of dining etiquette, <laughs> and you get a you get a better workout at Westchester yeah. hey, than you do in the military. We were right? like the, one of the first gyms with an indoor track. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were cutting edge for, for health education. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so Robert Thomas, who was also there, he says, none of us can quite figure out just what is going to happen next, except that there is something big in the wind. And so, you know, some, some thought about what was happening, right? And then a young man by the name of George Wackenhut um, said, and I, I don't, I would love to hear, you know, what he thought about this afterwards. He wrote back to Westchester saying, we are in the safest place in the world. <laughs> Westchester is more is in more danger of air attack. Hawaii is well over 4,000 miles from Japan, whereas Westchester is only 28 miles from Germany's air bases. Why, you have no idea how safe this island is. There isn't another place in the world as well fortified. An enemy Navy would never get near the place, and there isn't an airplane in the world that can fly far enough to come over here and bomb us and then fly back. So I'm sure it was... <laughs> right, right. But he did survive yeah. and, you know, and ended up coming back to Westchester actually later. Mm -hmm. um, on campus, the same kinds of things happened. Um, there was an accelerated program where, you know, because there was a need to uh, fill out the teaching ranks in Pennsylvania. So they made it possible for students to go to school in the summer and graduate in three years, which was new and, and to go out and student teach and, and get paid for it. Um, the, there were almost immediately they started to form committees, committees on soldier correspondence, air raid warning, conservation, American unity, fire aid. So it was, you know, uh, immediate. Um, and, and we were the first campus to host a U.S. Army postal training school, which I don't know if there's we have anything. So the. There were 3,755 men and women who trained in Anderson Hall, which of course is still here, and they drilled on Wayne Field and lived in recitation um, that officials converted in, into barracks. Um, and, and the campaign that they called on campus was purple and gold for the red, white, and blue. Um, and That's sort of interesting because we have, we've had a lot of discussions in some of these other uh, events about our school colors because they weren't actually... Me. You know, like they weren't solidified at that time, but apparently there was. It struck me, right? I mean, the, the, the particular article on the amulet, I want to say, was from 1943. Ooh. And that was the headline. And then there were a number of letters from soldiers writing really from all over the world sure. back to Westchester. And, you know, and again, striking that, you know, they would write and comment about how their time at Westchester influenced That's them. Yeah. That's nice. I mean, I love this, you know, Chelsea did worked on this, this case, and, and I, I really like, um, you know, it's a mix of things, but the one thing that we do have from Special Collections, I mean, obviously we have, I think this is 19, yeah, 42. 40, 43, 42, mm -hmm. but, uh, the first group then would be uh, these guys who were deployed. Um, we also have war ration books that, that are from Special Collections mm -hmm. as well, so we got a little bit of a taste of the home fronts. I mean, this is stuff that my grandparents went through, you know, so for me, it's very interesting to see these these ration cards uh, as well. Um, but then, of course, yeah. Sorry. Now, I was I was just going to say uh, for the Second World War, they did surveys also, and those are online in special collections. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if anyone watching this is interested, they can go into digital collections and they can pull up these surveys from you know guys who deployed and and mm -hmm. learn about them. Which yeah, is that's really cool. great. Really great, and then of course they came home, right? Right. And so this is a big, big case. We, 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 for the first time, really started to deal with kind of like the veterans' affairs, and, and what do we do? How do we integrate back? Right. Is what it says from war to peace. It says. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, and so that's I mean that's perfect, Michael, because the West Ch now Westchester State Quad Angles. Uh, in the fall of 1945, we welcomed a total of 36 veterans to campus. And of course it exploded after that. 
but they asked the question, what have you, the veteran, looked forward to most in returning to college? Uh, Lewis Johnson, who was a senior, said, most of all, I want to complete my studies and graduate so I can get started to living a normal life again. And, you know, I, I think that remains true for our student veterans on campus today. You know, so many of them, um, you know, who are, are sort of really, you know, buckled down because they want to they want to get through and they want to move on. And, and that's what to one today. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's what makes their service more remarkable. Yeah. Um, another one said, also, I am looking for peace, quiet, and contentment, as well as a good social background. All of these qualities are present right here in Westchester. Yeah. And then, then my favorite uh, came from George Klein. Uh, George Klein said, women first, education second. Semper Fi. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, some things don't change. Right? <laughs> right, right. Which goes back to Camp Blaine, right? right? I mean, yeah. that, there's another theme. And Did they have to go to Lancaster to find that? <laughs> probably or? not. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, those, those veterans who came to campus, uh, they started a veterans club. You know, now we have uh, the student veteran group and we have um, a, a veteran center. Uh, that is named after President Weisenstein and, of course, run by Lillian Morrison, who is absolutely extraordinary and a veteran herself. And if you're watching Lillian, hello out there. Um, so we, we had a veterans club. Um, and one of the things that, you know, you, 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 they, they, they needed housing. So they had six prefabricated army surplus barracks erected on Church Street and, and the athletic field to put the male veterans and the administration, I'm sure you've talked about it in other meetings, you know, there were rules here about, you know, all kinds of things. And all of a sudden the administration has war veterans here and the rules sort of seemed, you know, not appropriate for them. And that kind of opened up the door, which really goes on for the next couple of decades of students pushing, you know, to sort of loosen those rules, right? That's around. interesting. Yeah. You know, chapel attendance and, you know, the, the co-ed situation and everything else. And the other thing the veterans contributed to, too, was to broaden the curriculum, you know, the, to sort of, and, and it wasn't just the veterans, but the veterans certainly had a voice and it was growing across Pennsylvania that this should be more of a liberal arts education. You know, there should be more opportunities to do things here other than the traditional route. And my understanding is there had been momentum building for that anyway sure. on campus. And so that transition starts to happen. Right, that's true. We should, we should say that, you know, 1927 to 1960, where, where we have, you know, the, the Great Depression, World War II, Korea, you know, um, this is a time that we're the Westchester State Teachers College. So we're not a normal school anymore, but a four-year college uh, at the state level, but still to teach teachers. And, but you're right, you know, I think, there's that transition, especially after World War II, where you're figuring that these things are going to be somehow created into these liberal arts, state right. liberal arts mm -hmm. colleges, which happened in 1960. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We have uh, in Korea, I just want to give a shout out to my former next door neighbor, Tyler, who is a graduate of political science, his uncle, who used to live next door to me. He was a biology teacher here, uh, Dr. Holland Jack. He was uh, in the Korean War, um, he was deployed to. Uh, Alaska to uh, see if the Soviets could invade on a land bridge because they, they, the army wanted to use his uh, his his biology skills or or something. Um, but this is his footlocker, which is pretty pretty neat to, to have. Um, so thank you for that uh, donation uh, as, as well. It's also in the yep. and a yeah and a perfect. I, I know Chelsea's next question was to ask about after World War II. Yeah. And, you know, Korea is a good segue. Um, if you've been to our library, you're aware that there's a space upstairs named after Stanley Weintraub. Mm -hmm. And um, Professor Weintraub um, if, if he came to school here and graduated in 49. And I had the honor of meeting him a few years ago. Uh, Miss Morrison was there also, and we had I can't remember, and I, I, I want to say four generations of Westchester veterans in, in a room together, sort of having conversations, right, which was really cool. Yeah. And it, 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 
is again, back to his service, it was later in his life. And I remember, you know, he was having difficulty getting around, but he was really interested in talking with our students and sharing his experience. He graduated here from 49. He, he won a bronze star in Korea and he had a BS in education. And what he, what he said was, is, you know, when he, he went into the military, they saw the Bachelor of Science and thought he had some, so he became, he became a medic. <laughs> he didn't know, he knew nothing about any of that, right? So, and he ended up serving in a, a, a basically prisoner of war. He was a guard in a prisoner of war camp also and wrote a memoir about it, which is, which is pretty interesting. He, so Dr. Weintraub went on to write, uh, my count on his Wikipedia page is, uh, was 50 books. He wrote 50. Wow. I mean, can you yeah, imagine was, yeah. 50 books? Um, longtime professor at Penn State, uh, out at State College, and, you know, always a, a friend of Westchester, had visited campus a, a, a number of times. And, you know, probably, I guess, most known for um, uh, the book Silent Night, The Remarkable Christmas Truce of 1914, writing about that, you know, story of them coming out to play soccer, soccer right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and also in Korea, uh, Robert Habel, who, uh, you know, went on, he also earned a, a Bachelor of Science in Education, um, went on to serve with the first Marines in Korea. He earned a bar Bronze Star. He's buried in Arlington Cemetery. Um, he ultimately earned the rank of Major General within the Marine Corps. So um, I, and by my count, and I might be wrong, and I hope people out there correct me, um, we've had four attain the rank of, of General um, you know, from Westchester since the end of the Second World War, which is, you know, something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, including uh, a name that probably people recognize uh, who's been, uh, yeah, his service is amazing, uh, Dick Marion. Um, uh, Mr. Marion has been, uh, you know, just a, 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 he, he attained the rank of Brigadier General and continues to serve, I mean, any veteran event that you know I've been to, whether it's in town or on campus, he's there. Uh, played a big role in bringing ROTC back. Uh, big um, uh, supporter of the student veteran group and uh, organizations like the USO. And I, you know, any any time there's an opportunity to provide uh, veteran programming or veteran education, you know, he's he's always here. You know, which is pretty cool. Yes. So how did, uh, if we continue on with the timeline, how uh, Vietnam is always such a big debated topic, especially mm -hmm. here on campus. We have the Vietnam protests in 1969. So how, as a campus, were we affected by Vietnam? It's a good question. I mean, I, you know, we're, and I, some of you who are watching might be involved in Chelsea's part of it. And so is Chelsea's grandfather. If Chelsea's grandfather is watching, I, um, we were uh, up at the Marine Corps League, I guess, last week, um, talking with some of his colleagues. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of interviews right now. And if you're watching and if you're interested, um, talking to people from the area about their experience during the Vietnam War, both on campus and elsewhere. And there was student activism. And, you know, the ones that I, I've spoken to um, over the years, you know, tend to say that, you know, the, the, this campus wasn't as divided and wasn't sort of, you know, maybe as radical as, you know, Temple was sort of a hot spot and some others. Um, and there tended to be very much uh, um, uh, sort of a, uh, I, I support might not be the right word, but, you know, sort of looking favorably to the ones who were deployed. You know, for example, one alum, uh, was telling me about how there was a practice to where um, they, they wanted the soldiers to come home and they were against the war, but they had bracelets with soldiers' names on them. And mm -hmm. the idea was, was that when that soldier came home safely, they would, they would give that bracelet to the soldiers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, it was sort of nuanced. Now, there yeah. was anti-war activity. I mean, they, at one point they sat in at, at Phillips, mm -hmm. um, but there were also a number 
you know, who were at, in, at Westchester and, and went on to have um, really distinguished careers in the military and served in Vietnam with distinction uh, and continue to serve. Uh, one of the names that, you know, comes to my mind immediately is uh, retired Colonel Jim Williams, who um, is, is, you know, I've sort of gotten to know him just a little bit over the course of the last year. Uh, worked with one of my students last semester uh, doing a, a history, uh, looking at the history of African Americans on campus. And um, he was very generous in, in giving her time. Uh, he's involved with the Alumni Association, for example, and um, spent uh, a career and was in Vietnam and, and worked with a program called Chords, if you're familiar with that, and, and has become a nationally renowned um, advocate of uh, prostate cancer awareness. I mean, doing like amazing work. Um, and I, another one that reached out to me, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Thompson, who's also a professor out of Penn State. He went on to serve in Vietnam and his cousin, um, who's participating in our program. Uh, his name is George Walls, um, who graduated in 1964, so it was early, but served in Vietnam, uh, was a Marine, rose to the rank of Brigadier General, and uh, very uncommon for an African American to rise to that rank and, and have the career particularly during that time. His, his mom, graduated also from Westchester in 1940. Um, her name was Elizabeth Cooper Walls Gibson, which is kind of cool. So, so the, yeah, so I, I guess the Vietnam War era was, was complicated, yeah, right? I can imagine so. Yeah, I mean, there was so much, yeah, there's so much mm -hmm. strife anyway. I mean, it wasn't just the war, it was the racial integration, all these kinds of protests all at the same time. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, period. and yeah, and you know, right around, right, actually a World War II veteran, but um, uh, one um, gentleman by the name of Leon Bass. Have you encountered Leon Bass? Yeah. Yes. Why do I? Yeah, so. so he missed... read a little book, a book we... by, of his biography? He might have, but okay. what, so Leon Bass was one of six kids, grew up in West Philly. and. Right. I don't know if he was bus, but he, 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 first of all, he volunteered for service during the Second World mm -hmm. War. And because he was black, they put him into a segregated unit and he wasn't allowed combat and all the rest. But some watching probably know that during the Battle of the Bulge, some African-Americans got into combat because they, they needed people. And he was one of them. So he was a combat veteran in the Battle of the Bulge. And through circumstance and otherwise, he was one of the first people that got into Buchenwald mm -hmm. and wow. was a guy who came across Holocaust survivors really for the first, I mean, he was one of the first people they saw. Yeah. He came back to Westchester and earned his degree um, in education, went on to Temple University and received a doctorate in education and then continued his service. He was the principal of Benjamin Franklin High School in Philadelphia for a long time and then went to the George School in Newtown in Bucks County and taught history. Um, he's passed away now, but in 1996, he was awarded the Perlman Award for Humanitarian Advancement for his lifelong service in, in educating people about the Holocaust and also about racial oppression. I mean, because you know, here is someone who had to fundamentally fight for the right to fight for his country. And he's, he's doing so in a context against fascism and racism. Um, so sort of a remarkable individual. Um, so how does this service- Do you want to move? Let's, yeah. let's move. Let's, let's, let's go to the 1970s right. and 60s here. Um, yeah, so again, like I said earlier, we have our Vietnam protests. Uh, they clash here on campus, um, as Dr. Kodowski pointed out. So it was a very hostile time here. Um, and I think I see the Michael K scandal up there. And, you know, we just we just did an interview of, um, of a, a gentleman who was teaching during that time. 
And it, it seems almost like the politics played out more amongst the faculty and the administration. Yeah, I think that that's, that's you know, what it was. I mean, they did, what did they do? They hung uh, an effigy of Rossi. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, there was a cross burning too mm -hmm. that, was, that went on. But, you know, that kind of stuff, I think there was some backlash with students, but I think it wasn't more political. Yeah, in terms of the war, I mean, my understanding is, is that from the students, especially the social issues. And that was, you know, because it was a time when they were, uh, you know, I've talked to people who have graduated during that time period. And it's just like where they're getting rid of some of the dormitory roles right. and the dining roles and things like that. And so there was a lot of focus on that for students and, and certainly, you know, the, the Vietnam War. But, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things, and I think um, there's a book that's that's about the Vietnam War, and it's called a working class war. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, a lot of people who went to Vietnam were, I mean, it was very much class based. And so when you think about connections to people serving, they were more prominent here among students sure. than maybe at other schools. Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't have been you know, that, that uh, kind of hostility right. between, you know, aimed at soldiers. Class, uh, exactly, class right. School, right, right, yeah. right. So I think that's an important piece of it. But, mm -hmm. but between the administration and the faculty, yeah, they were, yeah. <laughs> they were going at it. Right. <laughs> well, so does this military service uh, continue on into our own time, such as like the, with the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan? It's a great question, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have, uh, Dustin Renninger's uniform here. He was here um, uh, five, six years ago. Got his degree. Uh, one of the one of the first current generation student veterans that I had the pleasure to meet uh, was a young man by the name of Lawrence Davidson. And uh, largely because I happened to teach about the Vietnam War, a number of those veterans were interested in taking that class to contextualize their experience and. You know, Lawrence came in and, you know, at that time, there really wasn't much um, overt support here for veterans, you know, other than, you know, mentors and things like that. And, you know, what came out of his efforts was the student veteran group and, and others, too, from that time period. I mean, uh, I think about uh, Steve McGinnis and Liam Larkin and um, you know, just, just a number of them. And of course, also with support from the administration and from President Weisenstein and ultimately the Student Veteran Center, Lawrence was the first coordinator of that. And now Lillian is, is there um, and just two amazing individuals. Lawrence graduated and went on uh, to continue to serve veterans at the county level. So, and in terms of faculty, I mean, you know, I. Uh, Kelly Fisher, who I, if you know, is, is a veteran. Kuyo Walters is a veteran. Um, you know, we have um, Greg Turner is, is a veteran. We, we have them sort of both as faculty and students. Um, and, you know, in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan, just, just a remarkable willingness to sort of roll up their sleeves and engage in, uh, in, our, in our current time less than 1% of our population serves in the military. So, you know, helping people who don't have a direct connection to the military have some understanding beyond a stereotype. Uh, it's amazing to watch our student veterans engage in programming and in conversations and in dialogue, you know, to, to help educate people. And, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, and I mean, as speaking as a faculty member, I mean, I, you know, teaching these gen ed courses, of course, I, I always have, you know, at least once a year, I'll have mm -hmm. some student veterans either on the GI Bill or they're still in some sort of active duty. Uh, and they're always, at least in my experience, they've always been very participatory, right? They add a lot to the class. Um, I've gotten close. There's one artifact, I guess you could say. This is from a former student. Um, uh, he's a psych student. Uh, he came to Italy with me, uh, did some research with me, Charles Floyd. Um, don't know if he's, he's here, but but certainly we appreciate him. He used, um, you know, this is from his training rifle at Fort Benning for his first deployment when he was 18 in Nicaragua for the Iran Contra affair. Cool. Um, and, uh, you know, spoke a lot about his many deployments in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then and then retired and came here on the on the GI Bill uh, to study psychology. And then he did. He went to Colorado, 
I think, to do conflict resolution. And yeah, so, right. I don't know if you ever met him, but he's a great, great guy. You know, really. I, I, you know, who I, psych, so. you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know if he's watching or not, but Lillian certainly um, would remember, and others would remember, a young man by the name of Kelby Hershey, uh, an amazing. Um, he he enlisted, deployed, came here, did ROTC, became fluent in Chinese, um, went back in. He's an officer now, but he deployed, redeployed to Afghanistan, and why? And that connection, right? He's in Afghanistan, and he's texting me. And he's like, hey, Dr. K, I want you to run the Army 10-miler with me and my boys. And I'm like, hell yeah, Kelby. Until then, I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> They're all much younger than yeah, I am, yeah. probably much fitter. But we, we did it. We had you know a reunion right, right before the pandemic, and, and we did it. And it was cool. So yeah. it's really nice. Yeah. You want to bring us around? I guess we're almost done. We're almost yeah. out of time, right? But just to kind of highlight things. You talked about a fire brigade that was founded, I think, or, or something like that back. Oh, in I don't know about a fire. Well, yeah, one of the committees. One yeah. of the committees. Right, right. Maybe from that there was a club, right? I mean, Chelsea used to in 1925, the cool. fire brigade club in Main Hall. So I mean, that's something. And again, this is an earlier amulet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the quad angles that you were talking about uh, is the precursor to the quad. Mm -hmm. um, as well, this is from the Aryan Society that you, we were talking about yeah. as well. Just to kind of give some things in perspective, I mean, the, in, from your own department, the Holocaust and Genocide Studies right. Right. Uh, was founded. When was that founded, Kelsey? That was founded in 2000. In 2000, right? So we have, um, you know, a, a Torah. Obviously, it's a, a recreation. The first book. The, the first book. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I have to take this opportunity to say that, um, you know, the current director, who you, I'm sure you know, Dr. Friedman, is receiving an award in, I guess, a couple of weeks, um, Educator of the Year. That's so, great. Or, yeah. yeah, so that's, yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's terrific program, yeah. Right. It is. It is a great program. It's the first, I think, in, in it, certainly in America, but but it could have been even internationally to have the Holocaust and genocide studies. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we get into that era, right? 2001, yeah. with uh, our own Michael Horrocks, who was also a Marine. Correct. Right. Uh, yeah. Passed away. He was, I think, the second pilot mm -hmm. uh, in United Flight 175. Um, and we have a statue uh, in Farrell Stadium. There's a there's a, there's a fellowship named after him. Yeah. A scholarship named after him as well. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah. yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Did you have any other content? You just want to kind of bring it across the, yeah, there's, yeah. you know, obviously we were permeated by all of this. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything on Ukraine because this came up before Ukraine. So that, yeah. is, that is true. Right. We do have some international monies from, from places that uh, we've had, um, you know, military here. We have some Vietnamese uh, money or, or Iranian. Um, as well, mm -hmm. some different Chinese. passwords. Chinese. No, Japanese. That's Japanese. Japanese. Is that Thai or Gandhi's That's India. Mm -hmm. That's India. Yeah. Uh, Colombia. Colombia. She's an anthropologist. A ten dollar bill. Yep. Just some other other kind of artifacts. You know, we're closing this. I'll, I'll give one more pitch. At the end of this month, you know, April twenty third is our big. It's Saturday is our big. Mm -hmm showcase uh, for the uh, finalizing the sesquicentennial year. I will be closing up the, the um, this is a, an interactive um, repository for a time capsule. Uh, so we have a lot of stuff in there and people will be giving more things. Um, and we're gonna close that up. We're gonna close this down. So please try to come if you can, if you're not you know, around the world. Uh, if you're in Westchester, please try to come obviously to our uh, big carnival, our big showcase on the 23rd, but also come and see this. We'll have student curators like Chelsea giving tours and, and doing all kinds of fun stuff. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. But any questions? I know we have some guests that might want to want to say something. I don't know. We can't hear. <laughs> Get the echo, echo, echo. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Jim yes. Williams here. I just want to make.
Colonel Williams, you, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I just want to make a little uh, comment about the uh, veterans during my time at Westchester. Uh, I'm a 1959 graduate of Westchester. In fact, 59 class was the last state teachers college class. Uh, and so I enrolled in 1955. Uh, and because of the Korean War and the uh, GI Bill, Korean veterans were coming back on campus. And that met, uh, established a, a different maturity for college students at Westchester. We adolescents had our priorities. The veterans had a different party. Uh, they were older, many were married, some lived on campus in those temporary World War II buildings that you were talking about. In fact, uh, three of those Second World War barracks were used as dormitory, and I stayed in one that was named Roosevelt. Uh, but they brought a different mature, uh, uh, maturity to the campus and a kind of different view. Uh, from an African-American standpoint, Westchester was a very really segregated uh, town at the time. And uh, it was kind of a beginning a transition of what was going on in America. Uh, at the time, when we talked about integration, uh, it was, you know, the population wasn't ready yet. Uh, these things take time. The veterans saw it from a different perspective because they had left their communities and had traveled throughout the world. And so they didn't understand why there was this institutional divide. Uh, black students couldn't uh, domicile with white students. But in the Roosevelt barracks, what some of the students did, uh, because there was two to a room, uh, a white and black student would stay in the same room and take another room and make it a study room. Well, this was a, this was against a protocol. And uh, uh, our dean of men, who happened to be the football coach, uh, didn't approve of this type of arrangement. Just one person I wanted to bring out was uh, Lefty Dimko. George Dimko was a veteran uh, a Korean veteran. Uh, he uh, was Marine. Uh, he got the Purple Heart. Uh, he came on campus during my tenure there. He later graduated, became a PhD. He got his PhD uh, at uh, Penn State University, uh, spent one year at Moscow State University during that time, and became the U.S. photographer. Uh, Demko was a great football player, but he brought a maturity and a different view to uh, Westchester. Uh, and many of us ran ourselves around George Demko, great guy. Second guy I'll mention, and then I'll stop, is my roommate, Ed Green. Ed Green was the first African-American in the Marine Corps PLC program. Uh, mm -hmm. When we were in college, the Marine Corps did not have a ROTC program. They still don't, but they would recruit uh, students to go into their platoon leadership class. And what you would do you, your junior year, you would spend the summer at Quantico learning how to be a Marine. And then you would graduate as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And so Ed Green did that in 1959, graduated uh, from uh, Westchester, went in the Marine Corps, and retired in 1981 from the Marine Corps as a lieutenant colonel. And at that time, he was the second ranking African American in the Marine Corps. He later went on to be vice president of Eastern Airlines. Mm -hmm. So just a couple observations of Westchester when I was there. It was a transitional time, and uh, the, the veterans brought a whole new viewpoint to college life. Thank you, Colonel Williams. I, you know, I'd be very interested in learning more about those individuals for sure. And I, I think, you know, you would be proud of our current generation veterans. I think they also bring in different ways an uncommon maturity and level of experience that um, very much carry on that legacy. I agree. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. Best we had so far. Good job, Chelsea. Good job. Chelsea. All right. <laughs>
if I can make a comment after like 12 of these things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, is somebody speaking? Yes, hello. My name's uh, uh, Kevin Kennedy. Can you hear me? We can. Now we can. Yes. yes. Okay, good. I'm also a Westchester graduate, class of uh, 69, a Vietnam veteran, Purple Heart uh, awardee. I know uh, General Abel, Marty Byrne, and Ed King as well. Uh, just to uh, Professor, your comments about Westchester during the Vietnam War, I think you're on the mark. I think most of the students, my fellow students, myself included, were first generation uh, uh, college students. They were there to learn. You can almost hit and get out and get a job. And uh, while people paid attention to the Vietnam War, it was not a, a, a primary or overriding issue on campus, to say the least. Yeah, that's my thought. Interesting. So, yeah. And nice to see Colonel, and nice to see Colonel Wayne as well, too. Thank you, sir. Very much appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome home. Well, actually, I just came from Mozambique a couple weeks ago, so I've been traveling a bit since then. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, this is Greg Turner. I just wanted to pop in. Um, I'm in the biology department, nursing a bad cold, but I really enjoyed this. But I, I just have a question involving um, veterans of, I guess, all wars. Is there any, are there any records? This is, I guess, either for Bob or or anyone there, Michael, um, for, for MIAs, any Westchester MIAs. Um, this is something that I've wondered for uh, uh, before about. I, I, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. It's a good, it's good question, Greg. That's gonna be our second book together. Hey, we gotta get the <laughs> first one talked about first. So <laughs> on that note, I'll be in touch soon. <laughs> it's a good question, Greg. We'll, we'll see if we can't get an answer to that. I know it was very specific, but I've actually wondered about that. So, okay. Thanks for, this was very enjoyable to all three of you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. No, thank and, you. And thank sorry you. we don't have the answer to that. And to uh, we the- We don't come across it. And, and I haven't seen anything. It's entirely possible. We had somebody perish on the Titanic. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm. all I can offer. <laughs> you need independent study. <laughs> any, other, any other thoughts? We'd love to hear from, from all of you. I know we're out of time, right? Well, certainly, you know, anyone out there um, interested in, you know, student veterans or have some pieces of history, uh, don't hesitate to contact me or anyone else in the history department. Um, and if you're around, we absolutely would love to see you on campus and um, arrange a tour of the Veterans Center and, and have you meet some of our current generation veterans. Um, and thank you very much for attending tonight. Sure. And actually I did, I meant to say, you know, Dr. Weisenstein came on Friday to cool. see this uh, exhibition. I don't think he's on, but um, you know, he, he did speak very fondly of his, you know, and he was very proud of, of the initiative and uh, go very fondly of the student veterans and he gives his regards, um, you know, so, so that was something I, I meant to, cool. to say earlier today. So. Yeah. Well, Jenna, Thank you very much. Very nice. Very, very well done. If there are any other comments or questions. Um, just want to say thank you so much for such a great presentation um, and save the date for next Wednesday, April 13th for our next lecture and tour. And we look forward to seeing you then. Have a, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks.